This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, Brad, and our new patrons, Victor, Patrick, Marco, and Hayden. On this episode of DTNS, X changes how articles are shared on its platform, BlackBerry enters yet a new frontier, and Dr. Nikki Ackermans is here to explain quantum dots. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. From Studio Secret Bunker, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From Alabama, I'm Dr. Nikki Ackermans. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Che. Earlier today, Microsoft let all of us know that it is rolling out a new version of Teams designed to be less resource hungry on both PCs and Macs. All right, let's get into the quick hits. Samsung announced the $30 Galaxy Smart Tag 2 with a revamped design. Similar to AirTag, Sam uh, Samsung is simplifying things with a single variant that supports Bluetooth and UWB with a new loop design that can attach the Smart Tag to something like a keychain or a bag or some other item that you want to keep track of. Samsung claims that the new battery can last for up to 700 days. It's also IP67 rated for water and dust resistance and supports Bluetooth low energy with a maximum range of 120 meters. The big limitation is it only works with Samsung smartphones for now. Imagine, if you will, a world where DuckDuckGo is the default search engine in private mode on Apple Safari browser. In transcripts unsealed by U.S. District Judge Amit Matai overseeing the ongoing U.S. versus Google antitrust trial, Apple did at least consider this when it also considered buying Microsoft's Bing search engine both in 2018 and 2020. DuckDuckGo CEO Gabriel Weinberg testified that his company had about 20 meetings and phone calls with Apple executives, but John G. and G. Andrea also said, to his knowledge, Apple hadn't formally considered switching to DuckDuckGo. I love that. 20 meetings, but we were never serious. <laughs> Amazon's space initiative, Project Kuiper, is set to launch its first two satellites, Kuiper Satellite 1 and Satellite 2, in a mission called Protoflight on Friday, October 6th, at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The satellites will hitch a ride on the United Launch Alliance's, or ULA, Atlas V rocket, or Atlas V. This is Amazon's real first foray into the satellite broadband market that would put it on par with something like SpaceX's Starlink and London bases OneWeb. Compass and Charter unveiled the first Zumo stream box, which the two companies first announced in April of 2022. Zumo is a next generation streaming platform on a variety of branded 4K streaming devices and smart TVs, which is designed to combine inexpensive subscription bundles with live television, fast or free ad supported television programming, and will include third party streaming apps like Disney+. Plus. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority, known as the CMA, has turned its attention towards Microsoft, specifically Azure operations, following questions from the EU about major cloud service providers, which by definition would include something like Amazon's AWS. Telecom's regulator Ofcom says it found issues with charges that cloud customers have to pay to move their data out of the cloud, discounts to only use one cloud provider, and technical barriers to switching between cloud providers themselves. All right, those were the quick hits. Let's talk a little bit more about X. Rob, what's the latest? Well, yeah, on stage at Vox Media's Code Conference last week, X CEO Linda Yaccarino said that 1,500 brands returned to the platform over the past 12 weeks and that 90% of the top 100 advertisers that stepped away after Elon Musk purchased what was then called Twitter are back on the platform. What has changed is advertisers not buying as many ads as they once did. According to ad analytics firm Guideline, monthly U.S. ad revenue has declined at least 55% year over year each month since Musk acquired Twitter and was down 60% in August of 2023. I mean, that probably speaks to a lot of the reasons that, you know, Twitter is uh, at least uh, experimenting with different revenue models. But here's what's getting the lion's share of attention today. As previously indicated, it would do, so it wasn't a huge surprise. X also started removing headlines from posted links, which 
Elon Musk claims will, quote, greatly improve the platform's aesthetics, end quote. He also said the best way for journalists to thrive on X following this change to just post long form content there rather than linking to it elsewhere. So if you're saying, well, what's changing exactly? Here's here. Here's how it works for now, at least in a mobile experience. Let's say I'm a writer at TechCrunch. I want to post a link to my latest story on X to get people to click through and then read my article that's living on TechCrunch. What you used to see from me would be a tweet, including a featured image, a headline, a brief description of the story by way of Twitter cards. They've existed for some time. You can see them embedded all over the internet, not just on Twitter itself. Now X. Now X cards only display the featured image from the article that I wrote without additional context. I could manually add a headline and entice somebody to, you know, to, uh, to, to learn more, but it's a lot clunkier. The real question here, I think, is where people, whether or not people are going to actually do this, or if people are going to use X less as a way to drive clicks. Now, Rob... Let's start with you. Uh, does this anger you? Does this bother you? What do you think? It doesn't anger me, but I, you know, I question, is this truly for aesthetics or is it because, well, we know that the more time people spend on our platform, the more money we can ultimately make. So let's up the character count from, I don't know, 250 to 25,000 or so and see if we can get all those reporters to actually write their reporters, not at their newspapers, but to write their content right here on our platform so we can keep all of the users that stuck around for us right here on the platform. That, that's kind of what I think is going on. Whether it will work or not, we, we don't know. I'm still on Twitter. Um, I, I would have to see how this or Twitter. I'm still on X. I would have to see how this works. I don't know that it would make me that, it would, that I would change how I actually view content there, but it may make me change how I post content there if I don't feel like people are going to be able to see my content and then come and you know and come and link to it because I don't necessarily try to build content on social media platforms. I try to use social media to get people to my content elsewhere. So I, I understand why Twitter is doing it. I don't know how this is going to work. We have to see yeah. how it will play out. Yeah, I mean even the uh, the long form content. Um, you know, the way that it has worked on Twitter now X, uh, was, you know, what we would call a thread, right? I mean, to the point where people now add the thread emoji, like, okay, yeah. buckle up everybody. I'm going to tell you a big old story. And there might be, you know, 20 tweets or, or more, you know, as, as part of the story, it, that has always been clunky in and of itself, but that was sort of the fun of the Twitter yeah. thread. Um, Nikki, clearly Twitter uh, cares more than just aesthetics at this point. Um, but uh, does this change feel like it impacts you or anybody that you know? Sure. This, as with every new development from Twitter slash X in the recent times, makes me just sigh. I feel like it's the, not to make a joke, but like the X that you can't stop checking on. Like you want to leave, but you can't. Because there's still kind of stuff <laughs> happening there. Um, this is a good metaphor. I'm just stretching it all the way. Yeah. Um, Gosh, it really is. <laughs> threads were clunky, but they were really digestible. As someone with a like short you know, interest span, I could see a, tr a thread tweet and be like, all right, I know that's a thread. I'm either going to look at it or not. If I hu see an entire huge block of text, I'm not going to look at it. Another thing is, if you're posting only the image with no title, that's incredibly misleading. It's probably part of their plan to, you know, create more clickbait, create more anger and frustration. We know that like people getting angry on Twitter is like part of the point, like part of the way that you keep people engaged is, you know, using potentially misleading images. How many times have you seen an article where the image exactly, like it doesn't make you refer back to the title to be like, wait, what is this about? Yeah. Um, I don't like that idea about it, you know, confusing users that way on purpose, potentially. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I feel like everything they do is just like, oh, come on. <laughs> well, and That's even, you know, I was trying to think like, okay, you know, everybody likes to, you know, dunk on what's going on with X these days because it does seem sort of chaotic from an outsider yeah. perspective. But, okay, what if long form content was just the way that it thrived moving forward? You know, the, 
everything about the UI has to change in order exactly. for that is to that work properly. Is that the place properly. where you want to go read that? Not really. Not right now. now. No. <laughs> it's like, I, yeah, I get where they're My going with tired. this. But it's like, that would be, yeah, that would be something that's very different than why we've all been there for so long. And that's it's a lot of half measures. Yeah, and just kind of like, oh, we're going to make this tweak. And it's like, that's a really big tweak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a really big tweak. All right, well, moving on to uh, something that has been tweaked quite a bit over the years. BlackBerry announced on Wednesday it would separate its Internet of Things and cybersecurity business units with plans for an IB, uh, IPO for the Internet of Things business next fiscal year. BlackBerry CEO John Chen said of the uh, the uh, of the of the move, both the IoT and cyber businesses address large and growing market opportunities. The new proposed structure will further increase both of their operational agility and uh, ability to focus on delivering exceptional solutions. Sounds like a lot of gobbledygook. Uh, Reuters reported back in August that private equity firm Veritas Capital had made an offer to buy BlackBerry. Even earlier, back in May of this year, BlackBerry itself said it would consider strategic options for its portfolio of businesses that could include the possible separation of one or more of them. So none of this is a huge shock. BlackBerry is selling off stuff, trying to figure out what has legs, what doesn't. Rob Dunwood, you know a thing or two about BlackBerry and its evolution over the years. Parent company yeah. formerly known as RIM, how things have changed since the former company went public back in 1997. So what do you think? Yeah, so but BlackBerry changed its name from Research in Motion. Um, it's 10 years ago. It was back in 2013. And it stopped making Blackberries in 2016. So the, the company that we know today is a very different company than what it used to be back when it was Research in Motion. And although I don't really follow Blackberry like I once did, this split kind of makes sense because the IoT stuff, you know, the, the, the QNX embedded systems, definitely the car systems, that's really all I know Blackberry for these days. So the fact that they're saying, you know, that they also do the security stuff, which I'm being honest with you, if, if I wouldn't have gone to their website, I wouldn't have known that that was like a thing that they were still doing. I, you know, I really mm -hmm. just thought it was the embedded systems and cars and, you know, you know, just other IOT type of things. I would have said, yeah, that's probably the company that I or part of the company that I would want to spin off into its own thing and see if we can take it public and make some money from it. So from that standpoint, it kind of makes sense. I but wonder what's going to go on with the cyber business side of things. Um, I, I think about the company that made the offer to purchase them a little while back. And usually what those companies do is they buy the company and then they scrap it for parts. So I don't know that that part of the business is, is truly viable. I, I guess we'll see here, you know, you know, going forward, if they, even once they do do this split, if, if it truly is, or if it'll kind of get sold off or, or just kind of go away. But 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 I understand it's like, you know, I, I take my feelings out of what Blackberry, what research in motion used to be. And it's like, well, this is what they are now. And they're trying to make a buck. And you know, like, they definitely are doing with IoT. When you when you go and you look at like Ford and GM and Toyota and Honda and BMW and Volkswagen, their entertainment systems are driven by, uh, you know, are driven by QNX. You know, it's, it's, dri it's driven by Blackberry's operating system, by their IoT type stuff. So that stuff is pretty prevalent. So it, you know, they they may they may be on to something by splitting that off and then taking that part of the company public. Gosh, I mean, especially with you know autonomous cars and a variety of uh, kind of infotainment stuff that 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 could be more of a, a money maker in the future. I wonder if if BlackBerry really has something here. What I'm Let's hearing is so. that. Blackberry is about to become a spirit Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's sad yeah. because I, I, I keep hope out, guys. I, th this is not just here for today's story. I keep a actual Aww. Blackberry brand new in the box on my desk just in case Jim Basilay comes back and says, hey, boys, we're back. I, I, I'm just holding out hope. Uh, wow. But it's, 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 not, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. Uh, what uh, model of BlackBerry is this? Let me see. That you have? This, that's a, this particular that's one. Not and yet unpacked. So I did take, I did box. open it up because I wanted to take the battery out. Mm. 
uh, so that the, you know, so that it doesn't explode, but I've got, you know, the battery for it, uh, you know, somewhere, but this is the Blackberry bold 9930. Oh, the bold. So, oh, yeah. but I actually have probably five or six unopened packaged blackberries that I've actually stuck in a vacuum seal bag. Um, just hanging on to them just, you know, 30 years from now, maybe they'll be worth something. I don't know. I've, I've got, really? I, I've probably in my life have had 60 or 70. You're beers. wrong. Yeah. Maybe during the zombie yeah. apocalypse, you'll have really good typing abilities. <laughs> I still, the last Blackberry, I, I had a few over the years. Uh, the last Blackberry I had was the Pearl. And that was what I had when the iPhone was announced in what, 2007. And I remember I, vividly. I, w- I liked my Pearl. The Pearl was, it was a bit big. Um, and, but I was used to it, you know? I was good at typing. It was fine. And I was like, I don't want an iPhone. No, I like my Pearl. And I, I stuck with that for a while. Uh, eventually I caved and now I don't know what I was doing. But uh, yeah, um, you know, shout out to Blackberry. Uh, uh, you know, le- let's hope your next incarnation oh, is a fruitful one. Haha, <laughs> fruit. That's good. <laughs> Get it? Yeah. Uh, If you want to stay up to date in the fast moving world of artificial intelligence, because it is very fast moving, do listen to AI Named This Show. It launched during DTNS Experiment Week back in August. Each week, uh, week, rather, Tristan Jutra and Taja Custodi weigh through the hype and the doomsday to keep you informed about the latest news in the AI world, because there is a lot of it. Catch it at AINamedtheshow.com. All right, Nikki, we talked very briefly on yesterday's show about a new Nobel Prize uh, that was awarded for chemistry. It was awarded to Monji G. Bawendi, Louis E. Bruce, and Alexei I. Ekimov for the discovery and synthesis of quantum dots. Now, that all sounds pretty great, but what are quantum dots? How, how do we explain them and how they help us? Yes, I'm so excited to do a Nobel Prize rundown. This is going to be fun. All right, I'll start with the quantum dots. So they are basically very, very tiny crystals, uh, only a few dozen atomic diameters wide, and they have a very highly tunable optical and electronic properties that you can use in the field of nanotechnology or in a fairly uh, important contribution. Uh, these dots fluoresce in bright colors, and they have applications in screen displays, LED lighting, and medical imaging. And scientists think that future applications could improve um, solar cells. There could, uh, they could help with the speed of quantum computers and also making lasers way smaller than they currently are. But uh, let's talk about how they came to be. So people actually, uh, physicists actually theorized about the existence of these quantum dots in the 1930s. And they thought that these tiny crystals, the millionth the size of a pinhead, they act like a box around electrons and they compress their wavelengths. So a smaller box would compress the wavelength smaller and this then would uh, emit a bluer light because of the shorter wavelength and a larger box would have a larger wavelength and emit a more yellow light. Uh, And then someone actually was able to create these crystals in the late 1970s, that would Ekimov, so one of the uh, laureates. And uh, alongside his team, he created these crystals and they were embedded in glass. So they existed, but they were not very useful because they were in glass. You couldn't manipulate them very much. But then in the, uh, a few few years later after that, another one of the current laureates, Bruce, and his lab were able to suspend them in a solution. So making them a little bit more manipulable. And then uh, finally, in the late 90s, Bawandi and his colleagues were able to devise a way to produce these crystals at specific sizes and specific colors, which made them a lot more practical for commercialization. So today, around 8% of the world's TV's market uses quantum dots to add spectacular color to their screens. Really, probably dumb question here, Um, but something (laughs) that stuck out to me was why would the smaller box be bluer in color and the larger be more yellow? So uh, the color blue is a shorter emission of light and then mm. wavelength spectrum and mm. towards yellow and reddish colors, it's a longer light emission. So when you compress it, it gets shorter and turns blue. 
Quickly, quickly. Put. So, Dr. Nikki, the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded jointly to Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman for their discoveries concerning base modifications that enabled the development of effective mRNA vaccines against COVID-19. Why don't we talk about that for a little bit? What do you got to say about those things? Yeah, so the Physiology Award is my favorite one. I'm biased. I'm a biologist, but I was definitely looking forward to this one. And this one, people kind of predicted. Nobody's too surprised. Nobel likes to make a big splash about, you know, current events. So the fact that this is a COVID related uh, prize is not too surprising, but nonetheless, quite good and exciting. So this team pioneered the research on messenger RNA or mRNA in the early 2000s. And they engineered these mRNAs to make chemical changes to uh, molecular components of base mRNA. And the reason that this is important is that it allowed the uh, body's inflammatory response to lower uh, in response to these mRNAs. And that means that it removed a huge barrier to clinical applications, meaning that you could uh, inject these mRNAs into people without them having a huge immune response, right? And thanks to this, future groups were able to deliver mRNA to human cells and uh, induce these cells into making viral proteins like those used against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And interestingly enough, this research was initially uh, rejected. I believe it was from science uh, from not be, for not being novel enough in 2005. Um, but uh, I guess oh. vengeance has come since they got <laughs> we the We were so young. Eventually. I know. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, in the, in the 2010s, they, they, uh, several companies picked up this research eventually and applied it for uh, fighting against Zika virus and MERS um, and creating vaccines. And because those uh, vaccines were able to be created at the time, that's why our COVID vaccines were able to be developed so quickly uh, in 2020 and save a, a bunch of lives. So this is obviously key findings. Uh, and, and I'll also note that Carrico became the 13th woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 120 years. So we still need to pump those numbers up. There's also yeah, been no, no black awardees of the science Nobel Prizes yet. And we're still waiting on that. Well, speaking of science, the Nobel Prize in Physics of 2023 was awarded jointly to Pierre Agostini, for Rank Krauss and Anne Lillier for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron electron dynamics in matter. All right, Nikki, what's an attosecond? <laughs> I'll break this one down for you too. I, these are actually all quite fun. Like they're not as ethereal as last year's ones. Uh, but an attosecond is a billionth of a billionth of a second. So it's a teeny tiny second. Oh, just, uh, and oh, yeah. Easy. Easy. No really, worries. Really short Chill. second. Yeah. <laughs> and this is actually the length of a time between laser flashes that were used to observe the movement of electrons. You need super, super fast lasers to observe these movements because electrons move super, super fast. Um, and the applications of this type of science have been used to observe how tightly electrons are connected to atoms and to see how electrons move inside materials. So really important for material science and things like superconductors. Um, this started out in 1988 where Anne Louye and her team um, shined an infrared laser through a noble gas. And this was kind of fortuitous finding, and they found out that it emitted UV light at super high frequencies. And when they overlapped these frequencies, um, they were able to at least hypothesize that it was creating attosecond pulses. And this was confirmed by Augustini, the other laureate, in 2001. Uh, and they developed the standardized technique for using this, um, for making these pulses. And then the third laureate, Krauss, and his lab were able to produce a single long 650 attoseconds long pulse in uh, a few in in 2001 as well some more future applications of this because it still feels a little bit nebulous um like i said it has applications with superconductor materials as well as potentially fingerprinting disease markers in blood molecules i'll also note that louie became the fifth woman to win the nobel prize in physics out of about 120 another one that we're working on hopefully for next year and uh, we still got some prizes going on. So the prize for peace will be announced on Friday. And the last one, the economics prize, is coming out on Monday. So you can look forward to those. But as I said, the science ones are the best ones. So 
That's the, mo- <laughs> the most important stuff already happened. Yeah, I mean, I think myself included, um, I, I learned a lot just now, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honestly, sometimes I go like, oh yeah, the Nobel Peace Prize, right? There are many different prizes to be awarded and there are uh, a, a lot of ways that these prizes get nominated and then awarded, uh, which we will be talking about uh, in Good Day Internet after uh, we're done here with DTNS. So stick around for that if you want a little bit more. I want to find out how to get nominated. Insider (laughs) science track. Yeah, with Dr. Nikki. Uh, But uh, before that, let's check out the mailbag. So Robert weighed in on our conversation earlier this week on Monday, in fact, about AI pins from the company Humane. We talked about the fact that Humane had showed off this idea of uh, more or less, uh, uh, you know, uh, putting something on your hand that was sort of a smartphone alternative to be able to do a variety of things, but didn't really offer a lot of details at that time. Okay, so uh, here's here's what uh, Robert says. If these pin or roaches are going to be screenless, I could see them replacing something like the iPhone or iPad device that is used by museums for location-based tour guides. Assuming they're smart enough to use the location-based Bluetooth dots, somebody would wander a site or exhibit, perhaps point these devices at a QR code, use the location-based tech to trigger information about the exhibit. These devices should be quite cheaper without having to have a screen and less likely to need repairs. I think that's, I, th- I think that's actually a pretty good use case for this. Something there. I, I always have my hands full when I'm in the museum. I've got like my latte, my cookie, and <laughs> I don't know how I would like, where I would project that, but I'm down for more technology in museums. I mean, I you know, if it was something you were wearing rather than something you were holding, I could see that oh, right. being it's projecting it like, off yeah, of your yeah, like from your lapel type thing. Um, you know, this is again just Robert sort of pontificating on 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 uh, use cases. Humane probably has <laughs> something beyond museums going on uh, yeah. as far as what it would like you know uh, us all to do. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, it seems a little bit more real than it did, um, uh, you know, uh, at the uh, original announcement. Well, Dr. Nikki, uh, you're not going anywhere because we are going to talk more about the Nobel Prizes uh, after DTNS wraps up on GDI. But for now, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. Absolutely. So it's just my name everywhere. I'm at NicoleAckermans.com on my website where I've got updates about my research and all that. And I'm Ackermans Nicole on X and NicoleAckermans.Blueski.Social. Blue, blue Sky. I still can't say it right. I like Blue Ski better. It looks like Blue Ski. <laughs> it does, does look like that, doesn't it? Blue Ski. <laughs> yeah. B-S-K-Y. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, well, uh, we are so thrilled to have you here with us as always talk about some science stuff um and uh yeah we're gonna be doing it more often so i'm glad you're back from (laughs) vacay yay so patrons stick around for the extended show good day internet we're going to talk more about nobel prizes how they get nominated how they get decided and all the drama that happens in between Mm -hmm. Indeed. But just a reminder, you can catch DTNS live Monday through Friday. We do it at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back tomorrow doing it all again with Andrea Jones-Roy joining us. Don't miss it. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>